God bless you, dear friends. We're so glad that you can join us today for another Word from the Word brought to you by your friends here at the Madariaville Assembly of God. Uh, we're so grateful for each of you. We're grateful for those who are faithful to come here to the sanctuary week after week on the Lord's Day as we gather together to celebrate Jesus. We're also very thankful for those of you who, because of various reasons, cannot be here but are able to listen in online. It's not the same as fellowshipping with other believers, but any way you can get the Word of God, we believe it's going to have an impact upon your lives. Now, there's no doubt that these are perilous times. These are dangerous times that we're living in. Uh, you can't listen to the news without knowing that these are very uncertain times. But one thing I'm so glad about today is that the Bible tells us that we can build our lives upon an unshakable foundation, that foundation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I hope that you're ready to receive the Word of God together. I pray that you're ready to hear the Word. We're going to be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, please get them. Have them ready to read. If you don't have your Bibles, pause the video, please, and uh, go get your Bibles and come back. As always, I know I sound like a broken record sometimes, but I want you to check out what this preacher tells you by the Word of God. Well, let's read together. Matthew, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. That would have been the city of Capernaum. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy. That means he was paralyzed. Could have been from any number of reasons. Lying on a bed and Jesus seeing their faith, apparently the faith of those who brought him, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth, talking about Jesus. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Obviously, he showed one of the signs of deity there, uh, omniscience, knowing their thoughts. For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? Good question. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Let's pray. Father God, open up your word to our hearts, to our understanding. Give us ears to hear what you would speak to us by the word of God today. Lord, we want to say yes to your word. We want to be uh, able to hear and receive all that you would have for us in Jesus name. Amen. Well, in this part of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus and his disciples are having some incredible times of ministry. there about the shores of the Sea of Galilee, both sides of the Sea of Galilee at that time. On the west side of the Sea of Galilee, there have been many healings, many deliverances from demons some of the largest crowds that Jesus had ever experienced uh, during his earthly ministry were seen there at that time. Uh, there were so many people that they would try to get through and just touch Jesus. And in touching him, touching his clothing, they would be healed. Then we saw that they made the trip over to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and there they experienced a completely different kind of reception. On their way, they experienced a tremendous storm, a storm that the uh, Word of God in one place calls a seismos, a, an earthquake-like storm, something that literally shook them to the very core. But they learned during that nighttime storm at sea that if we have Jesus in the boat with us, that we have nothing to fear. And I would just remind you, we've already spoken of these perilous times. Walking in these perilous times, make sure that you are there with Jesus and that he's with you. If you have Jesus in the boat with you, you need not fear anything at all from the storms that this world is facing. Still very, very true. Now, when they arrived on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, there on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, they had a completely different reception. They were met by a demoniac, dangerous, deranged, living in the tombs, destructive, 
to himself and possibly to others. He was indwelt by a legion of demons, not just one demonic spirit, but an entire legion. And when Jesus was confronting these demonic spirits, they, they begged not to be cast into their eternal destiny. And of course, Jesus could do that. But instead asked to be allowed to go into a herd of pigs that was nearby. And some find it surprising that Jesus allowed this to happen. But immediately, when they went into the pigs, they jumped over headlong over the cliff into the Sea of Galilee, and they were all drowned. You say, why would Jesus allow that to happen? Well, I believe that he was showing to all who were present, very visually, pictorially, that Satan's goal, the goal of his demonic spirits, is to kill, steal, and destroy. His ultimate goal for that demoniac was to see that ultimately he'd die without Christ. If you're not saved, that's what he'd like to see happen in your life. He'd like to see you die outside of God's salvation. Don't let that happen. Turn to Jesus today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Call on the name of the Lord today and you can be saved. Now here in Matthew chapter 9, we're back once again on the other side. We're on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, back in Jesus' home base there in Capernaum. Remember, he was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, but at this point in ministry, Capernaum is his head quarters, his home base. He's probably staying, I believe, in the home uh, of Simon Peter or perhaps one of the other apostles. Jesus never had a home of his own. But in that home, the people were packing in so tightly, there was not room for even one more. They were packed in like sardines. And then outside the house, around every window and around the doors, the people were packed so tightly, there was not room for anyone to get near Jesus. Now you are probably familiar with some of the other details of this story. Some details that you can read in the other Gospels, for example, in the Gospel of Mark. We're told there in the Gospel of Mark that four individuals brought this man to Jesus, that they carried him up on the roof of the house, and then they lowered him down through the roof, pulling the, the shingles or pulling the tiles away, pulling the thatch away to let Jesus see this friend that they had brought there. They wanted to see him healed. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been uh, just tugging this uh, man on this pallet, this mat, uh, through the crowded streets there of Capernaum, finally getting to the house and seeing it was just going to be impossible nearly to get him through the crowd. And, and if they could even get close to the house, there was no way they could get into the house. And then I believe that the Lord gave them a, just a word, a creative word. Let's go up on the roof. And even that was a job, I believe, getting up the stairs, the ladder, whatever it was, pulling away the tiles and then lowering their friend down. Well, when Jesus saw this man, man, as always, he dealt with the most important priority first. He took care of his spiritual need first. He said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. You see, you can go to heaven leaving behind a sick body, but you can't go to heaven if you still are lost and without God in your sins. Now, we're not told what kind of a sinner he was, but he was downhearted, I believe, because of his sin. He knew he was a sinner. Jesus told him to cheer up because his sins had been forgiven. There's nothing any more worthy of rejoicing than knowing that our sins are forgiven. This lets us know that this man was downhearted not just because he couldn't move, he couldn't operate his limbs, but because he knew that he was lost. He knew that he was still in his sins. So burdened down by a physical condition, but even worse, burdened down by a spiritual condition. I think of individuals like Johnny Erickson Tata, perhaps you've heard of her, paralyzed in a diving accident as a young woman. And I'm sure she's had her moments of, of, of just having a difficult time like all of us would. But you know, she's such a person of joy, even though she has not yet received a physical healing. In fact, one time she said these words about her condition. It's when we find Christ in the midst of our most hellish circumstances, that's when we experience heaven's joy. So it's about knowing and experiencing him, even in the midst of all these other things. Physical healing is wonderful. We pray for the sick around here and we trust God to bring healing to the sick. But I want you to know that you can go to heaven from a sick body, but you can't go to heaven if you don't know Jesus. 
There's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. Not two ways, not five ways, not four ways. Only one way. Jesus said, I am the way. But before the day was over, this former paralytic was set free both spiritually and physically. Healed and delivered. Healed and forgiven. You would think that the entire community, those that had known him and known of his horrible condition, would have been thrilled by what they had seen. Not so. Oh, many were glad, I'm sure, but the religious crowd that were so jealous of Jesus and so critical of Jesus, they felt it was blasphemous that Jesus would dare to speak of forgiving this man's sins. The other Gospels tell us, say, Rightly said, only God can forgive sins, and that's very true. No man can forgive your sins. No priest can forgive your sins. I can't forgive your sins, unless, of course, you've sinned against me. But only God can forgive sins. What they did not recognize was that this one that was standing there, this one that they were observing and being so critical of, was more than just a man. He was not only their Messiah, their, their promised coming king, but he was God come in human flesh, the one who did have the right, the ability to truly forgive sins. Now, Jesus showed them very clearly that he not only had power to forgive sins, but to do other things too, because when he healed the man, he simply told him to take up his bed and go home. That miracle proved beyond all shadow of doubt that that same Jesus had the power to also forgive sins. I want you to notice something here. The scriptures do not really speak, I don't believe here, of this former paralytic's faith. Now, he may have had faith, but it's not spoken of. But it's the faith of those who brought him that is commended, first of all. Jesus saw their faith, the Bible says. I pray that he sees my faith. I pray that he sees your faith. I think of words that Jesus speaks of in uh, I believe it's the Gospel of Luke chapter 18 and, and verse 8. He says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus returns to planet earth, is he going to find you walking in faith? I hope that he is. Is he going to find me walking in faith? I pray that he does. We're warned in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 that without faith, it's impossible to please him. Not that it's difficult, not that it will involve great effort, but that it's impossible to please God outside of faith. Our good works, our works of righteousness, our good intentions, none of those things can please God. Only faith can please God. Now, there are different levels or different types of faith. There is the faith that simply believes in the existence of God. Some seem to think that they're okay simply because they're not atheists, because they believe that God exists, that there is a supreme being, and that's a good starting place. But that will not save you. The book of James is very clear on that. It says that the devil himself believes that God is, and he trembles at that knowledge. But it's important that we do start with that. We believe that God is. And then there is that kind of faith that goes on to seek him. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first of all, what? Believe that he is. That's the first level of faith. And then secondly, not only believe that he is, and that he's also a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's the next level of faith. Then there's what I want to speak about today. What I am calling for the purpose of this message, stubborn, persistent, persevering, relentless faith. Not stubborn in the negative sense of the word, but in a very positive sense. Here is how that word stubborn can be defined. Stubborn can be defined as having or showing a dogged determination, not changing one's attitude or position on something. I think of it as digging in. It could be defined as not giving up easily. Uh, synonyms would be persistent, tenacious. I pray that we would all have that kind of stubborn, tenacious, relentless Faith, that faith that does not give up easily. I find many examples of it in the word of God, and I pray that you and I would have it living and very vital in our own lives today. Back in the Old Testament, I believe that we see that the patriarch Jacob showed that kind of stubborn faith. 
He had an experience in the night season one time. It does not appear to have been a vision. It does not appear to have been a dream, but something that was really happening. He wrestled all night with a strange being, a supernatural being. Who was it? Well, let's read and see if we can find some clues. Genesis 32, beginning at verse 24, And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So it says he was a man. At least he appeared like a man. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So this, this being makes it very clear that he could have bested Jacob at any time, but I believe there was a lesson to be learned. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, that's Jacob, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Now, some scriptures seem to indicate that this one called man here was an angel. Angels generally appear in human form on the earth. Others would seem to indicate that it was the Lord himself. Uh, Jacob does refer to him in another instance as Lord. It could be that this was what we sometimes call a Christophany or a theophany. Uh, that's just a theological word that means a, a, an appearing, a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ in his, uh, before Bethlehem, I guess we could say, in, in a human form. Sometimes in the Old Testament we see him appearing that way and he's called the angel of the Lord. Not that Christ is an angel, but he is the messenger of the Lord come to earth. Several of these in the Old Testament, and this may be one of them. But whoever this strange, strange being was, Jacob recognized that he had a heavenly origin. This being that had come to him, this being that he had literally wrestled with all night long, and Jacob was really no match for him, but this was to teach some things to Jacob. And finally, Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Now, this is a picture of the kind of stubborn faith that I am talking about this morning. Have you ever, quote unquote, wrestled in prayer? clinging to the promises of God and saying, I'm not going to be deterred. I'm not going to be defeated. I'm not going to be disheartened. I'm not going to be uh, discouraged. I'm not going to give up by the power of God and by the grace of God until I receive what has been promised to me. I'm not going to let him go until I receive the promise that I have been given. Sometimes we call that, quote unquote, praying through. Relentless, stubborn faith standing on, believing, and clinging stubbornly to the promises of God. Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I will not be denied. Then back in the New Testament, we find a woman who had an ailment called an issue of blood who showed that kind of faith. Her story is found back in the chapter where we begin later on in Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 20. It says, Behold, a woman which was diseased, with an issue of blood twelve years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now, can you imagine how weak and anemic she must have been after having had basically hemorrhaging uh, probably some kind of a female problem for going on 12 years. We're told elsewhere in the Gospels that she spent a great deal of money. In fact, all of her livelihood she'd spent on calling doctor after doctor. All of the medical expertise of that day was called. And the Bible tells us that instead of getting better, she only grew worse. Mark's words are very telling here. Mark says that she suffered many things of many physicians, and it would be suffering in those days. I'm told that they have unearthed the, uh, the skeletons of individuals that have been the quote-unquote victim of medical science of that day. Holes bored in their skulls, for example. You know, sometimes they believe that if you were bleeding, perhaps there was too much blood in your body, and you had to bore a hole somewhere, or you had to get some leeches to get rid of some of that excess blood. But whatever the case, this individual, this woman, had tried everything in the natural. Here is a situation where she felt like she had tried everything. I'm sure she had tried all of the home remedies, all of the things that the others had told her that would 
take care of her situation, but it was only growing worse. She was like a leper in the sense that anyone with a discharge of blood like this was considered unclean and was not to be around other individuals, let alone to touch them or to be touched by them. But that did not stop her because she had stubborn, relentless faith. In her weakened condition, weakened condition, and through those massive crowds, she may have literally had to crawl on her hands and knees. We're not told, but I can just imagine how, you know, the hem of Jesus' garment would be down at street level. As weak as she was, can't you just imagine her having to kind of squirm and, and make her way through to Jesus, perhaps to crawl those last few feet of the way and just to touch the hem of his garment, not letting anything or anyone deter her. She knew that if she just touched Jesus, she would be healed. And praise the Lord, she was. A 12-year condition healed in a moment of time simply by touching Jesus. I believe stubborn faith says that even if I have to crawl to get there, I know that Jesus is the answer. No matter what stands in my way, no matter how many other things I've tried, no matter how many other earthly remedies I've tried to find for my situation, I know that if I will seek him with all of my heart, if I can just touch him, he'll make me whole. I will not be denied. And then third, we think of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, showing that same kind of stubborn, relentless faith. Mark 10, 46 says, And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. You see that prefix bar in a Hebrew name. It means the son of something. So he was bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus set by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. And he cried the more a great deal. So they tried to shut him up. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He keeps crying out. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, arise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, wilt thou, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So this blind man is crying out to the Lord for help and the crowd is trying to shut him up. The crowd is trying to discourage him. Uh, the crowd is trying to dishearten him and I, I want you to know that there will always be those people that, that try to stop you, that try to hold you back. But you've got to have the kind of faith that says, I will not be denied. I will not turn back. Jesus heard his incessant cry. Jesus heard his cry of, of faith. And Jesus gave him a miracle, the likes of which was never seen in the Old Testament. There's not one record of a blind man receiving his sight in the Old Testament. This was to be the mark, the sign of the, the Messiah when he came, opening the blinded eyes. Jesus says, go your way. Your faith hath made you whole. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Bartimaeus had that kind of stubborn relentless faith and that he would not let anyone discourage him. He would not let anyone dishearten him. He would not let anyone turn him aside. He would not let anyone shut him up. He said like the others, I will not be denied. Friend, don't let anything stop you. Don't let anyone stop you. Don't let anything make you quit. Have stubborn, tenacious, relentless faith. And then number four, the four friends in our original scripture, they also had, I believe, that kind of faith. They were willing to go to where their friend was, to pack him on a cot, to make their way through the streets of Capernaum, carrying him through the crowds of people. If you've ever carried, carried anyone that was that so-called dead weight, you know how difficult that can be. Sometimes it would have been easier for them to have stayed home, I'm sure. 
When they got to the house where Jesus was, it, it, it still seemed impossible. When they saw the size of the crowds, and, and there were probably thoughts that came to them, there's, there's no way that we can do this. But, you know, faith was still there. We're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. I believe that it was this kind of faith that it caused them to lug him and tug him and get him somehow up that ladder, up that flight of stairs, up to the flat roof of that house. I believe that it was faith that caused them to pull aside those roof tiles or that thatch that was on the roof. I believe it was stubborn faith that caused them to lower him down in front of Jesus, knowing that if he could just meet up with Jesus, that their friend's life would be changed forever. They would not be discouraged. They would not be disheartened. They would not be deterred. They would not be shut up. They would not be stopped. They had stubborn faith. And like the others, I believe in their hearts, they were saying, we would not be denied. There is nothing that's going to stop us from getting our friend to see Jesus. Absolutely nothing. I will not be denied. Now, what does your faith look like this morning? Do you have a stubborn faith? persistent kind of faith, a tenacious faith, a faith that hangs on and does not give up, a faith that does not quit easily. You'll reap a harvest if you do, if you faint not. The word of God makes it so very clear. Don't give up when your faith is being tried. It's during those trials, those times of testing, that the spiritual fruit of patience begins to grow in your life. That spiritual fruit of patience grows in times of adversity. It grows when your faith is being tested. It's not really growing so much in the good times. Hear the word of the Lord, James 1, 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Some wrongly say you don't want to pray for patience because it will make you have trials. No, you're going to have the trials anyway, friend. Just know that if you continue to have faith in God in the midst of those trials, that that wonderful spiritual fruit of patience, of perseverance, is going to continue to grow in your heart and life. Through patience and the comfort of the word of God, we have hope, hope, a confident assurance. Romans 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, that's the word of God, they were written for our learning that we through patience, that's not giving up, and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Hope means a confident assurance in the New Testament. The Bible tells us that we will have the promises of God if we have faith, and patience. We need both of those things. Hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. Hebrews 6, 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience, believing and then hanging on, inherit the promises. Hebrews 10, 36, for you have need of patience. Don't give up. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Do what God commands, hang on to the promise, and then have faith, continue to have that stubborn, tenacious faith. Hebrews 12 says that we run the, the race, we live this Christian life patiently. Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That means without giving up the race that is set before us. My prayer for you and my prayer for myself today is that God would give us all stubborn, tenacious, relentless faith, faith that does not give up, but says with full assurance, I will not be denied. I don't know what you're facing today, friend. I don't know what battles you're enduring or have endured of late, but I do know what God has promised. I think of how a bulldog gets a hold of something and doesn't let go, doesn't let loose, and I pray that God will give us that same kind of faith that grabs hold of the promise of God and will not let loose. So hang on to the promise of God, friend. Hang on tenaciously. Hang on stubbornly. Don't give up. There's an old hymn that I had not heard in many years, but came to mind as I was preparing this message. It's entitled, I Will Not Be Denied. Let the words of this song be your prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, until we meet again, may God hold you in the hall of his hand. Maranatha. Maranatha.